thank you very much for the organizers for having me and uh, for the attendance for, for coming. It's actually a lovely spot and it's been a, a, a great conference, especially because of the uh, variety of topics that have been discussed and the variety of points of view that have come up. That makes it definitely keeps us on our toes. So um, I also am, well, let's see, I should tell you what I'm going to talk about and also tell you first maybe my um, collaborators. This is Amanda French who moved from, who is a student of Michael Taylor, who was with me at uh, McMaster for three years, now has moved to Haverford, and Chi Ru Yang, who came to the fields and then to McMaster. And um, it's a little bit, um, what can I say, it's a little bit humbling to not be talking about a, a new theorem, but an old theorem, and in fact an old theorem of Sergio's, as well as uh, Chata and Hormander and some others, from uh, about 30 years ago, if not a little bit more. So, okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and I have just, and, and I, to my justification for doing this, well, uh, maybe it's just a shift, slight shift in point of view. Uh, I don't know if there are advantages, but at least it articulates something in a, in a different language. So it's nothing new here, and uh, I apologize for that, but, uh, but sometimes it's good to, to revisit uh, older, older things. So I'm going to tell you about a nonlinear wave equation. I'd like to talk to you about transformation theory, because I, I think that's what we do not do in PDEs, uh, is, is change variables. Okay, we change x to y. And we change u sometimes to u squared, or u squared minus d by dx of u. <laughs> but we do not, sorry? G-R, you do. G-R, so Sergio does it all the time. But most of us don't. And in, and in, in relativity, you are still just doing local, local coordinate transformations, but you're not changing a bonic space to another coordinates in bonic space. And so that's part of, so we're starting to do that a little bit, but it's really rather undeveloped. So here's, a, toy example where you change coordinates in a bonic space to other coordinates in a bonic space, at least a neighborhood of a bonic space. And uh, I'm going to do it in a, in a Hamiltonian framework, and then, I, and then I need estimates to make everything work. So that's the format of the, of the, of the, of the show. Now it's been implicit since day one of this conference, and uh, I'm going to articulate it. I'm not sure anybody else articulated it, so I'm talking on the wrong day. But okay, why change variables? Well, let's just look at scalar ODEs. Z dot is equal to Z squared has an exact solution. Oh, for small data, or any data, but for small data, we think Z of zero is equal to epsilon. Think of epsilon small. Then Z of T is exactly epsilon upon one minus epsilon T, and it has a time of singularity, one upon epsilon. So that's, the, that's the, what was called the quadratic blow up, because Z squared. And then, you can always read my slides. I hate covering people who cover their slides. There's the cubic case, w is equal to w cubed, and its exact solution is root of epsilon squared over one minus two epsilon squared t. If I start with, if I started with data epsilon, and then the time of existence is one upon two epsilon squared. That is, I have an order of magnitude longer uh, uh, existence time. And that's the point. Cubic lasts faster than quadratic. Okay, that's pretty obvious, certainly to everybody in this room. And also, it doesn't change if you, at least not essentially, if you move things around a little bit, like I can add a linear term and it makes it a little complicated, now Z and W are complex, and higher order terms don't normally, without special details, change the fact that singularities can occur. So let's talk about the real problem, which is a nonlinear wave equation. So I'd like to talk, I, I'd like to talk about uh, equations which look like this, two time derivatives equals Laplacian, so really starting with a, the with a, a background linear wave equation, and that's the linearization at zero. I want zero to be a solution. Then uh, some nonlinear term, which I'll make more precise later, but let's say that it is at least order m minus one in its variables. So like the quadratic case would be square in its variables, and cubic would be cubic. And I want to solve the Cauchy problem. So initial data at time equals zero, g and initial momentum, H. And so a basic question in PDE is sort of something people spend their careers studying is what's the time of existence? If I give G and H in some 
some class of functions, maybe a sublib space, that's what I will use. I'll tell you what my z is going to be later, or several z's later, several possible. Then um, you want to know how long does a solution last. And of course the best result is if it lasts for all time. And, uh, and uh, so that I'm really working in the class of small data, all time, you know, glo global existence. Okay, so this was worked on in the 1980s. Uh, I think uh, Sergio's thesis is on this. And then a lot of work of, of Zadie's was fundamental. And on this, there's work of Hormander in the, at the time and Jalal Shatat at the time and others. And I'm probably leaving off people in the room so you can shout at me, but do it after the talk so we don't waste, because time is running and Frank is here keeping track. <laughs> and so uh, just real and really short, here is, uh, here is an existence theorem, a global existence theorem. Suppose that one half times the dimension minus one times m minus two. Well, the nonlinearity was order m minus one for Hamiltonian reasons. So n minus one, dimension minus one times m minus two, if that's bigger than one, then for small Cauchy data, data in an appropriate Sobolo space, time existence is infinite. And it's a balance, as everyone knows, between solution spreading out and decaying, which is a, a dispersion, certainly not a strong dispersion, but a dispersion of sorts, and the nonlinear effects trying to focus things and put things together. And if the solution is small in that Sobolo space, the dispersion wins. And just, I know everyone in this room knows this, or most people in the room knows this, but what's the linear decay rate for the linear, what's the decay rate for the linear wave equation, which for small data will be reflected in the decay rate for the nonlinear wave equation. And it's of course uh, C over T to N minus one over two, which reflects that first factor, which is part of the story. So let's just do that, just, just calculate if m is equal to 3, so the nonlinearity is m minus 1 is quadratic, then, how do, then when do we satisfy the hypothesis? Well, I need n minus 1, m minus 2 to be bigger than 2, so n better be bigger than 3, which is bad luck for us because we live in 3 space. Well, according to us, we live in 3 space dimensions. That reminds me of a funny joke about Feynman, but I'll tell you afterwards too, for, <laughs> for, reasons, for reasons of time. But if m were 4, if you had a higher nonlinearity, then you do the calculation and n is greater than 2, which is a little, also, which is good news for us living in 3 space, but a little bit bad because 2 is also interesting to mention. And then the borderline cases have these almost global existence where you get exponential time of existence uh, in the border, in the two, when, when you get equality in those two dimensions and two nonlinear cases. Okay, so I haven't said anything wrong yet. That's more or less how things stand. Well, transformation theory. It tells you there's an interest from going z to w, right? There's an interest in taking a, qu a quadratic nonlinearity and making a change of variables, maybe in Banach space, maybe in a neighborhood of Banach space, so that you no longer have quadratic terms but only have cubic terms. And this was an idea that was developed slightly after uh, the, 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 the things on the first slide, uh, but it's still alive today because there's some uh, Mas Moody has some work here, uh, uh, and uh, some of his ideas has, have entered in hyperbolic situation with Pusateri and Chata a couple of years ago, which, which revisit the idea of changes of variables, or essentially changes of variables, to get rid of that, that, um, the, ob the obstacle of a quadratic term in the equations. And so I think I'd like to, I'd like prefer to say that in the following way, if for special nonlinearities to satisfy a special condition, which Sergio called a null condition, then for dimension three, that was the key one, you can make t uh, uh, existence time be equal infinity um, by a transformation which got rid of the, of the quadratic term in favor of more complex uh, cubic terms. And in dimension two, that extended, it's a borderline case, and you got exponential time existence. So the idea is change variables. And uh, one thing that strikes me though, uh, because we try, a number, of us, a number of us try, is if you make a change of variables, certainly in the style that, of this theorem, it's hard to make it again. That is, you start with an easy nonlinearity that's maybe polynomials or something, and you make a change of variables, 
and it's complicated and non-local, and just try again, it's not so, not so trivial. So what I want to do is introduce Hamiltonian formal, for, form, uh, formalism, which, uh, which um, helps, uh, helps the idea of making changes of variables, uh, but you have to do it rigorously, but it gives you a, um, gives you a systematic way of, of, of doing this. So let's see what I can do. Well, I can't do every n. In fact, we probably don't want to do every n. The ones that interest me are the ones really that come from physics, or the ones that come from a Lagrangian. So uh, I, I'm interested in, equa in, a, in non, -linear, non linear wave equations that come from the, the principle of least action. Actually, that sounds very pretty in French. It's the principe de moindre action. I like the word moindre. And, uh, and then uh, the action functional is a time integral of a Lagrangian. And uh, the Lagrangian, I want to start at the wave equation, so there's a quadratic part in the Lagrangian, plus other order terms. And the reason my nonlinearity initially was order m minus 1 is because I want this term to be order m. And it satisfies some smallness conditions for, for small argument. And then once you have this form of wave equation, uh, you can affect uh, a Legendre transform at least locally near zero, where you really just do satisfy, the, follow the, for, the classical formula, uh, formalism. You can take a variation of L formally with respect to UT, you'll find P, uh, and you call that P, and that starts out with a UT, a U dot, plus a higher other terms, and this is algebra, well, or the implicit function theorem, but locally in each X and T to come up with a new coordinates, uh, uh, U and P, where every time in the Lagrangian you're going to see a ut, you have to say, though, ah, that's a function of p and as well as a function of gradient u. So uh, the Legendre transform then puts us into, gives us a Hamiltonian, which is a bona fide Hamiltonian, uh, and it's a function of u and p, and it's really just this form. And you evaluate every time you see a ut in the Lagrangian, as I said, you have to use that implicit function theorem. Of course, that's a changing from u, u dot to u, p, but that's not a change of variable in Banach space, that's point-wise, u of x and p of x, it's a, an algebra locally. So this is, a, of course, a Hamiltonian system in Darboux coordinates, where u dot is equal to the gradient of h with respect to, uh, with respect to p, gradient, in this case, it's Darboux with respect to the L2 in, inner product, and p dot is minus gradient respect to u, and it's a first order system of equations equivalent to the above nonlinear wave equation. It's not the only way to make a first order system, but it is an elegant way of making first order system that carries through certain, certain other structure, which I like to use. Okay, let's do it for the nonlinear wave equation, because I was just doing something kind of general-ish and very soft, but if L is equal to that uh, a quadratic term plus the higher order terms that come from the, the, um, the, uh, the um, principle of least action. L2 is the Lagrangian quadratic is the difference between kinetic potential energy, at least the linear version of kinetic potential energy. And then you do that exercise with H, and H is H2, which is the sum of potential, kinetic and potential energy, plus a changed R, which is related to P by that change of variables and they are or of order m, as I'm indicating by the superscript, and then you differentiate, as I told you on the previous slide, n, to get n, which is the nonlinearity, and then it's order m minus 1, nonlinearity. So that's, everything's, I think, consistent so far. So, I'm sorry, let's do something simple. Uh, let's find the plane waves it tells me I have to find, so it says solve in Fourier transform, it's the, uh, the linear equation. This is what averaging theory is about. Gives you a dispersion relation. The dispersion relation tells you um, where the dual light cone is. Uh, in, with the speed one, the light cone is the same as the dual light cone, but still, just remember it's the dual light cone. And then uh, here's what we want to do. Um, I want to make a transformation from, from z, which is the vector, u, vector function up, which lives in some Bonnock, some Bonnock space, it'll be a Sobolev space, to a new variable z prime, 
uh, and I want and I insist that this lives in the same Banach space, and I want to, that transformation to be the following. I want it one to be canonical. Well, it's because I'm going to design transformations to eliminate things, and uh, if I make a general change of variable of a vector field, that involves the Jacobian of a general change of variables. And it's harder to invert a relationship which involves a transformation and a Jacobian than to, to just think about the trans just worry about the transformation itself. So being canonical allows you to sit within it allows you to change variables, to, to design, what do you say, design or change of variables without the Jacobian bothering you. The, the fact that it's canonical is dealing with some algebra of the Jacobian. And that tells me, that, that tells us that we can come to a new system of equations for z prime, which is just like the old system of equations for z, but with a new Hamiltonian, where you just compose, well here it has to be the inverse, uh, z in order to get the new equations. And so the new Hamiltonian is going to be change of variables with its, with its uh, orders of, uh, of nonlinearity. And to be in Birkhoff normal form to order capital M, it means that you retain uh, every term between 2 and M. You, by this process, you don't change 2, by the way, in at least what I'm thinking, but you change 3 and higher and then you choose what m is, and then your, your order, the, the, the residual will be m plus one-th order, and uh, that will remain, and you insist upon your change of variables having these terms being only resonant terms. For example, zero. Sometimes there are no resonances, and you want zero, and zero is good. For example, if you get rid of everything, that's even better. Sometimes you can. So each zm retains at most only resonant terms, so in this, in this parenthesis, only resonant terms, and resonant terms are the ones which you could say Poisson commute with this quadratic Hamiltonian. Another way to say that is that um, they um, preserve the same action integrals that the, quadrat that, the, that the linear wave equation preserves. Okay, it's a called a reduction to Birkhoff normal form, and in dynamical systems, it's part of averaging theory. And um, we only want to do it once in this talk. In fact, it's work in progress, as I said in my second slide, so that's all, all we've done so far. Okay, so when m is equal to 3, and I want to consider the resonances, those are known as three-wave interactions, or triad interactions. And those, you... you um, you can um, find by a formalism which has to do with the, um, the wave number. Uh, so I have to preserve, I have to conserve momentum. So I need three wave, oh, C is in Rn, I should have said. I could write that. Because it's a little confusing, the, the, the coordinates. But my C is a vector in Rn, and this is space. Sorry, it's a hat of space. And that just says that I conserve momentum. And then to be resonant, the frequencies have to add or subtract. So a triad resonance is one with frequencies adding and subtracting three, threefold. And, um, okay, and then back to the PDE, uh, you know, infinitely many, almost infinitely many papers have been written about this on a formal level, but back to the PDE, I'd like to understand the construction of such a canonical transformation and its mapping properties on which Sobolev space, on which Bonnach space. And then you usually think of these, these as discrete uh, indices of a, um, of a dynamical system, finite dimensional Hamiltonian system, finite indices, or on a compact manifold, they would be discrete. But here we're in continuum, and continuum plays a role in what we're going to talk about. So when x is an Rn, it's important where x is. A wave equation on a torus is going to be a different story, so I'm not doing that. When x is an Rn, c is an Rn, and it's a continuous variable, and things actually sometimes are a bit better. That's one of the things we'll find. So here's something about wave equation triad interactions. 
proposition is, suppose I have a triad interaction. Then the three Fourier transform vectors, each C1 is a vector, the three vectors involved in those three modes are collinear. Proof of the proposition is the picture. So uh, the picture, okay, is transparent, but it's not that transparent. So I want to redo that on a, on a blackboard that'll make it a little bit more clear. But what I want to say is um, the, the resonance set is an intersection of light cones. So, oh, dual light cones, dual light cones. So the dual light cone, positive going forward, backwards going negative, you make it out of, um, these are n plus one vectors in space-time. C0 is the space-time component. Super index are the components of a n plus one vector. And it's where C0 is equal to plus or minus the length of C. That's the dispersion relation. Okay, now let me interpret that picture for you. Remember, I need omega of C of 1, I'm going to call omega 1, plus or minus omega 2, plus or minus omega 3. To be, when it vanishes, that's what it means to be resonant. But I, uh, uh, my problem conserves uh, momentum, so also I have to have these three vectors add to 0. So, uh, since the, 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 since the, um, the, um, the, um, the convention is that omega is always positive, I can't have plus, plus, plus. So at least one can be minus, and then it's the same as if two are minuses in order to have a non-trivial resonance, except for at zero. Zero is a special case. And that tell, and since omega is monotone increasing, because it's omega is equal to C, right? Omega C is equal to C, length of C. Uh, that tells me that this is the big one, and then there are two smaller ones in length that are catching up. So let's draw that in one dimension. I'll draw big, so I have a big blackboard here. So here is uh, the omega axis. Here is the C axis. And then, um, and here is, say, C1, and then here is the dual light cone. So if I go up to here and over to here, this is, of course, omega 1. Nobody doubts that. But I have to add the Xs, so I, I would say that I go along here, and this is going to be minus C2, and then this distance here is minus C3, so that C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0. And that tells me that this height is, of course, omega C2. And the thing that my applied mathematician friends to, uh, taught me is to understand a three-wave, uh, a triad resonance, take the dispersion relation, which is, by the way, over here as well, and, and put it up here. And so if I go from C2 to C3, that's going from here to here on this copy of the dispersion relation, right? That's a, a second copy. And so this height is omega 3. And so that's uh, omega 1 is equal to omega 2 plus omega 3. It's completely clear, the whole line, so everything's three-wave resonant. Okay. But I want to make the, but that's a picture in higher dimensions. So any higher dimension, so this is the first component. Any higher dimension is now, here's the, all the other components. And I think it's best if I fix C2 here, so we don't get confused, minus C2 here. And I'm going to make a resonance by moving C1 around in a circle with a, a sphere with a, a fixed radius. And then I'm going to see what C3 has for us. So I'm going to go over here. This is going to be C1. This is minus C2, so minus C3 is that. And then I do the same picture. Above C1, I draw C2 and C3. And the result is this. Here's the big dual light cone. That's above C1. Here's the little dual light cone. That's above C2. And this height from here to here is C3. And it's completely clear they only touch on the axis. And that means they're all collinear. 
That's that picture. Re yes. Uh, uh, do you really need, need like, oh, I have the impression that you have just a triangle, and one of the sides is some of the, the length of one side is the sum of the length of the two other sides? That's this triangle. I mean, you, you, that has nothing to do with like code, no? Well, this is to conserve momentum, but up here, the intersection of the two graphs of the, of the dispersion relation is the resonance. I need to satisfy the omegas of those exes. Yeah. And so these two have to touch, and that's not just a triangle. Yeah, but the, 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 the excites were built a triangle, and what, what, the, 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 the resonance condition for the omega say that the length the, the, longer, uh, the length of the longer side is the sum of the length of the two. For the wave equation, you can say that again. This is a picture of that. This is a picture of that. Yeah. That's a picture of that. Absolutely. Okay. So, proposition proof. Now, everything which is resonant is collinear by two proofs, in fact, of this. Jean had a proof and I had a proof. Okay. Um, how do you make canonical transformations? That's the second thing, because there's an obstacle to doing this. You can't just do anything ad hoc. You could try, you might touch upon one, that's a good idea, but um, there are actually, uh, uh, there are mechanisms built over history by which you can uh, construct um, canonical transformations. And one of the famous ones is to th th use the fact that any flow is a canonical transformation. So solve the Hamiltonian system, fix time, that move points around, that is canonical. And so, you, so the idea which really dates to Birkhoff is uh, find an auxiliary Hamiltonian system, my wave equation is H, so I'm going to solve for K. Uh, hindsight, actually foresight, tells you that K should be cubic if you want to re re remove quadratic terms in your equations and flow that k by, so, and form a Hamiltonian vector field with the k, and flow that k, and the solution map is going to be your canonical transformation. So in order to do that, or at least to see what k should be, uh, it's useful to put the problem in complex symplectic coordinates, which is things that many people, uh, uh, many people use for many cases. In fact, I think Kenji had coordinates very similar to this in his talk. And then if I re rewrite, H, the regular, regular Hamiltonian, from U, P to Z is canonical, essentially. And in the Z coordinates, H has form which is modified but nice. So the wave equation looks like this. This is the linear wave equation, looks like that. Then all those terms involving uh, the M equals 3 and 4 and 5. They are now multilinear uh, convolution operators, which we saw in other people's talks, uh, uh, some, looking something like this. And the CPQ, which depend on the Fourier transform variables, um, are the interaction coefficients. And I want this to be multilinear, so I just noted it down there. The Hamiltonian satisfies a null condition. This is my modification of the statement, and I'll explain the relation in, in a minute. Uh, if that interaction coefficient, these are the, if I take m equals 3, I'll have th three z's and I'll have c with three uh, indices. If those interaction coefficients vanish for every resonant triad. And now that's equivalent to Kleinerman's definition. Well, Kleinerman only has one wave number, right? Because you plug, you have a, a polynomial nonlinearity of cubic order and you and you make a, a symbol, so to speak, out of its derivatives, but you put in one wave number and it has to vanish. But we've seen that we're in a situation where we have to, we're taking the Fourier transform of a, of a function, so we have double convolution, three functions, there are three wave numbers. They're the same because of the collinearity, that any resonance, all three resonant, wave, uh, resonant Fourier transform variables are just three multiples of some base variable, and Kleinerman's definition is testing the base variable. That's basically it. So without doing a general situation, let's do a particular situation. Here is a cubic Hamiltonian that gives rise to a null, a null form. And it's probably the simplest one I can think of. And I'm going to put that in the equation, and then I'm going to talk about removing that with a canonical transformation. So 
express this like I did in the previous slide in Fourier transform variables. Okay, it somehow looks a little messier than I usually think, but this is easy actually. So H3, you can read it off. There's a P and then the U squared and a P, but you have to write it in Z's. And so there are a lot of cubic terms. Well, I guess there are eight different possibilities. So I put down two characteristic ones. And then this distance difference is this difference. And the normalization ended up with the factor of normalization. So that's a term which expresses H in Fourier coefficient, in Fourier uh, coordinates. Then the formalism to eliminate H, uh, which is really doing the standard thing, but in the continuum on a function space, is to find a K3 such that it's plus on bracket with H2 gives you H3. Because then the time one flow of K3 will eliminate H3 and will modify H4 and higher. And you do that despite triad resonances. And now the whole, the whole rest of the point is to find, to show that the Hamiltonian vector field actually has a well-defined solution, solution map on an appropriate bonic space with maybe some continuity and smoothness. I'll talk about what you can expect. And I need it, I need it as a bounded co continuous transformation of a neighborhood to a neighborhood in bonic spaces. Okay, so what, so what does the solution of a cohomological equation look like? Well, it kind of looks like the uh, Hamiltonian with cubic terms of, of, of z's and this prefactor, which is the interaction coefficients, which is what the equation is telling us to do. But to get rid of h, you have the, what, are, what are the denominators? Those are the things which can be small and zero. And that's what the dangerous part that you have to deal with. So think of it as uh, coefficients with interaction coefficients with these powers, the other interaction coefficients with different combinations of z's and z bars, etc. I only, I only put two terms down. There are, I think, eight or so terms in this. Uh, okay, let's see. The first denominator is non-zero except at zero, so here are the non-resonant terms, so that's cool. Just, that's fine. The second denominator is this vanishes on a resonance set, which I drew for you right here. And then the null condition uh, tells me that the numerator vanishes exactly where the denominator vanishes. So it is where, where it is on, uh, on, uh, on collinear three um, Fourier transform vectors. And it's completely clear because I made my example with which is sharp, which is a, uh, which is a, uh, Ginevra's proof of my resonance condition. It says that says it's sharp, uh, sharp Cauchy-Schwarz in Rn. Okay, so then I have to solve that vector field, and so I have to. So now I'm going to solve z dot is equal to Hamiltonian vector field involving K3, which I'll, I'll call this Hamiltonian vector field, but but solving is not time. Time is what you do in the physics. Time is what the wave equation solves. It's an auxiliary parameter that I'm going to take to one. I start, it starts out the identity. At time one, it is my transformation. So I'm going to call it S. That's probably a bad choice because there are a lot of S's in our lives, but okay. And then the flow map uh, is at when you evaluate at time one, that's going to be my transformation. And it's going to be, and it's tau three because I want to normalize the cubic terms of the Hamiltonian. And the next thing I'm going to do is tau 4, except this is work in progress, so I'm not going to touch it, but okay, tau 3. And then the question is, does the flow map exist? And it's a little bit bizarre because it's not a PDE. So, Hamiltonian vector field is this. I differentiated the K3 and put multiplied by i and a few things here, and it has lots of terms. I have lots of dots. Now it has about 32 terms. Okay. But, but we see what the, what the difficulty is, what we're going to have to worry about is, here's a non-resonant denominator, two of them because that's the structure of the first term, but here's a resonant denominator. And we're going to have to make sense of this evolution equation with these uh, coefficients. So uh, let's think about it. Um, Z was made out of U and P. Its L2 norm is not the, is not the energy norm. So if you forgive me for making 
a non-canonical change so that I have a new function related to the old function w, whose L2 norm is the wave energy norm, then it's a little bit easier, the kernels to be a little bit hom more easier, so, more, so they're homogeneous. They turn out to be homogeneous, and so then the analysis is, and so then you have to do a local analysis on the resonance set. And the resonance set's not too complicated, but you do have to do it in, in patches. And it turns out that it, the, the, the kernel looks like this, uh, plus uh, other variation, variants of that. And here's a local estimate. There's a bounded part, which gives you no problem, but there are singular regions. And the singular regions mean that even with a null condition, it's not a bounded vector field. It's not a bounded vector field. Now, how can that be if the numerator vanishes when the denominator vanishes? Well, hey, this is in higher dimensions. If we're a one dimension, numerator and denominator cancel, but this is high dimension, so the singular parts are when the cone fits all the way down to the bottom of the cone or up in the top. So there is, there is this singularity. So it's not a, among other thing, not a Lipschitz vector field on any reasonable monic space that I know. Maybe not none, I don't know, but anything you can think of where you want to be, you have to do something else. So what, what do you do? Well, we do PDE, vector fields, any interesting vector field is unbounded. What we need is not that the vector field is bounded, but it, its inner product with the, with the uh, position vector in the Hilbert space is bounded, because we don't want norm to grow too fast. That's called an energy estimate. So consider how, if I take just standard Sobolev space, and I take the, and I, and I suppose I have a solution, is the, is the HS norm controlled of that solution? So take D by DS of the L2, no, of the HS norm, of that solution, just to see if you have a chance of approximating it and, get a, and getting a well-defined flow map, and it's bounded by z cubed. And so it will blow up for large time, but for, su for sufficiently small data, you will have a time one flow map. So that's what I want. So, but then, what's the drawback? Hey, the technology for the wave equation can fit here, but it's a lot better in invariant norm Sobolev spaces. So uh, this is not, this is nice to know, there's some cancellation, it's unbounded vector field, but it has energy estimates, but it's not quite what, quite what we want to do. So take angular momentum operators, take dilation operators, actually I only want to use those two. What happens under Fourier transform? Well, you know, angular momentum, the JL angular momentum operator, and it was a function of x, that should be a little x, sorry, is equal to angular momentum operator in C. Of course, it's, it's translation, in, it's, a, it's a Fourier transform invariant. Uh, dilation operator, if you dilate an x, you collapse in C, so you just get plus an extra term. So under, under Fourier transform, you get the same operators. The operators obey the Leibniz rule with regard to these kernels. That's because the kernels are designed for things which, are in, which, are, which have good behavior under dilation and which are translation invariant. <coughs> Not under each xi, but under simultaneous rotation, rotation by xi. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a frame invariance. So you then don't just take linear derivatives of your function, uh, but you, all, you also take angular momentum de derivatives and dilation derivatives. And actually, let me be a little bit more precise. So uh, the function space z is where we work, but I just want to make that change of variables to get to the w's. So I'm going to look at a w Sobolev space. And I want w, but oh, w is a function of xi on the Fourier transform side. So I want um, multiplication by xi, angular momentum by xi, dilation by xi. That I want to be in L2. And I want those to be in L2 when you sum their terms up to order S bar. And S bar is not S because I need another index. But the Fourier transform, uh, the un-Fourier transform allows derivatives. It's actually a disaster to put derivatives on the Fourier transform side <laughs> because you want, a no you want a neighborhood which stays, stays fixed. And, uh, and, if, and if you um, put derivatives on the Fourier transform side, you put weights on the space side, and the wave equation propagates things, and weights make them grow. So you want to stay with a space that looks like this. 
Here's a little bit of amusement. This is an old estimate of, of, of Sergio. It says that W, the, the space coordinate version of W, is bounded by, the L infinity norm is bounded by this invariant norm, Sobolev space. But it's completely self-evident the Fourier transform has L infinity as well. Just because, in fact, you don't even need all those derivatives. You can use less, a few angular momentums, and only one dilation. The hard work was energy estimates in the z space. So you have to take angular momentum and, and lambdas and control the z's. But the basic, the basic theorem is there the um, energy estimates work. And so you can, for, for, for a ball radius epsilon in the z space, solve the, the k equation uh, the, 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 the vector field, the auxiliary vector field, Hamiltonian vector field given by K3 up to time 1. And then that flow map is your solution. Is it a flow? Well, what is a flow? Should a flow be C infinity? Should a flow be differentiable? Well, you know, with PDEs, a flow is, can be continuous, but is rarely differentiable in the same function space in which you're sitting. But you do have a Jacobian, and that, I'm sorry I got squeezed into the bottom slide. The Jacobian of the flow, that is the z derivative of, 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 the, of the solution map at time s, minus the identity, is bounded by z Sobolev norm, but you lose a derivative. And if you look at two derivatives of the map, you lose two derivatives. So it's a what I want to say, it's reasonable to consider to think of PDE solution maps as flows, smooth flows, but on scales of spaces, because you don't expect to have differentiability in the same space, but the Jacobian is bounded a space down, etc. Sometimes it doesn't have to go all the way down, sometimes it can go lose half derivative, but that's what I think, is, that was a little bit of propaganda, that's what I think. Transformation. The transformation z prime is tau 3 of z, which is the flow map at time 1, achieved a canonical transformation of our Hamiltonian. So it's new Hamiltonian. Remember, you, you, you plug in your new variables. It has no, Z, no H3 anymore. It only has a remainder of H4. And the remainder at 4 even is very concrete, made out of some Poisson brackets of the K3 that we had already had in mind and the old H4. And now M is 4, and we have that improved existence theory of the, of the of the former theorem of the 1980s. It just happens to be uh, by a canonical transformation. So, what's the point? Well, I think I wanted to elucidate the, um, the, the Hamiltonian sense of what it means to be a, a, a triad resonance, which involves three wave numbers and three linear modes in, the inter in their nonlinear interaction, and the null condition which involves one, and that was partly the lemma, that, that almost trivial proposition which says that, that, th that such wave numbers, such resonant wave numbers have to be collinear, and then the estimate which says that you can make an analytic sense of the mapping in, in a, such a thing. But of course a goal would be to aim for the dimension n equal 2, where one transformation is not enough and it would be nice to make a second transformation. Well, this also is an old theorem. <laughs> so it's also coming back to an old theorem. I guess it was, the audience is probably better than me at the, at the, at the history of this, but Alinak has a, has a, has a theorem. Also, uh, Hoshige has two papers, and Jean-Marc Delors, uh, who's been at this conference, has at least one paper on the global existence for small data in n equals 2. And there are transformations in it and other considerations. I'm not sure that each one of these papers has exactly the same uh, condition for the, for the third order terms uh, as, as each other. But I think those should be uh, self-evident, at least from a Hamiltonian point of view, by uh, considering them as resonances between the, the plane waves. And, um, and it's clear that they're not going to be it's not going to involve just one C. They can't be collinear as soon as it's four. They might be in planes, but they're not collinear. Okay, everyone knows, okay, oh, sorry, I was going to state the theorem, excuse me. Uh, the standard argument 
is, uh, oh, that's right. So I don't have to go through this argument because it's a sophisticated audience, but uh, I'll just put it all on the board just so you know that I know it, <laughs> which is if you have linear, if you have decay of linear equations at time n minus one with, with decay rate time n minus one over two, you also do energy estimates in the, uh, in the space, in the, in the z space, and uh, you're going to end up with the C1 norm of your solution up here. This is solving wave, C1 norm up here, but because I've increased m, I have an advantage here. This is why the m minus 2 shows up, because 1m is, you've done one of the m minus, the, 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 the last m is on the, on the ground, this is considered the coefficient, and you replace this with that uh, Sobolev estimate from, that I showed you us three slides ago, and put this on the right-hand side, it gives you, an, it gives you a, bound, a, a trapping uh, zone in, in the initial data uh, solution space, and uh, that shows you cannot form a singularity. And if you do it in, uh, in the borderline case, you don't get a trapping zone, but you do for a while. And for the while is for exponential time. And then I'm done, so thank you. And I'm ahead of time. Yes, please. What yes. happens for uh, nonlinear Schrödinger? Can you do some, uh, the, the same type of uh, arguments? It's a nice idea. Uh, of course, we've had that idea, but we haven't pursued it. But why not? Why not? Why not? There, there, there were papers uh, in the last century by uh, Hayashi I on uh, uh, nonlinear last century, which has a polynomial in gradient. Right. And, right. and uh, at some point, there was some kind of uh, almost global existence in some. Uh, I don't remember the details. But. Okay, it'd be good to revisit that. I did write a paper on the comparison because for small data, uh, for NLS, there's a small data scattering result. And there's also the normal form. So scattering, you could think of as a normal form. It's just not very explicit. It tells you the solution is linear if you go forward in time and backward by linear. It tells you con it's a way of conjugating your, your equation to linear. So that's, that's one conjugation. Another conjugation, of course, flow backward in time and then compare with a linear equation backward. There's another conjugation. They're related, but there's another conjugation. And a third conjugation, well, you have to do it time after time, you know, order by order, is Birkhoff normal form. But if you have scattering, why should you Birkhoff normal form? But scattering is, so, okay, that's a hard question to answer. But one thing you have with the normal form that you don't have with scattering is explicit mapping. You know what your solution does where. You know how you're changing it. So I have a paper which compares scattering with Birkhoff normal form for small data. But it's not a big existence picture. Well, maybe it's, it's something, maybe it's something. It, our, our effort there was not the uh, c compare the existence theory. It was sort of discuss scattering. But I think the existence theory also would be worth it. So, more questions, comments? Well, yeah, th th there was uh, a paper by Chartan and Poussaté where they sort of made this connection between resonance and non condition. Right, so that I, I mentioned that was in my slide four, I think it was. So it's 2012. They use the, um, the method due to Masmoudi, Mas Chata, and uh, yeah. Pierre Germain. The resonance method, right? right. The and it's sort of a time. space resonance, time resonance. So that's a, it's a, it's not a change of variables. It's a, yeah. it's an inspection of a Dumel formula. No, I'm just talking about just the yeah. connection between resonance. And yeah. Because the, re the resonance set would be the same as the one. Resonance set would be the same, and the singular, the, the, and you have to singular, have to, you have, you handle the singularity in a certain way. Interesting about that is you need regularity on the Fourier side. So that's a, a piece of this is it comes out that you can control regularity on the Fourier side of the transformation at least. They certainly don't eliminate the quadratic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. More questions? And they don't go twice. They don't go twice. So I'm aiming at twice. Not twice. You have to change variables again. That's what Birkhoff normal form is. You you, you change variables, and you adjust some coefficients, and then you adjust them again. Yes. Yes. 
So, so the basically for the quadratic nonlinearity mean the condition is correspond to the the coefficient and the resonance term is zero. You know, it needn't be. It needn't be. Um, my example, it turns out to be yes. Yeah, but uh, is there any uh, the analog of the the two linear form? So, in view of the in the formulation of the broker normal form, it is not difficult to find out what is like a, the coefficient of the the the, the ternary, the two linear terms. Right. Then, the if such such a coefficient is zero, then can we have a sort of a, like a, some sort of easy formulation or a condition for the the, the in physical side, like the null, null condition? The null condition is on the Fourier side. Oh, you, but I guess it's on the physical side too, yeah. I think probably it's the same. Probably it's the same. The, the null condition, you plug in one wave, wave number, one, one Fourier transform variable. Space, you plug in one space-time C, and you test whether something is zero. But, but my sense is, on, when you do go to the quartic nonlinearity, you will have more resonances which are not all collinear, and so you have to compare, say, pairs of Fourier transform variables. It will be like that. Suppose there's a pair of Fourier transform variables, each one on the light cone. How can they, how can they interact? It will be algebra a little bit like that. But w one thing I want to say, but is not exploited in this, which is on a f compact domain, like a torus, um, making a normal form uh, involves dividing a Fourier series coefficient by the resonant relation. And if it's zero, you cannot divide. That has to stay there. But in the continuum, it's very possible to divide by something which is zero. For example, the Hilbert transform is a perfectly bounded operator, which, uh, which has a singularity. So I really haven't you know, found a place where it's very nicely articulated, but the potential is there that it's too strong to demand the vanishing of the interaction coefficient, just to demand that the, re the, re the, 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 the relevant vector field um, after, you know, expressed in Fourier variables has a sufficiently um, regular singular integral formulation. And so you could say that. Even if they do vanish, you see that the vector field has a singularity, but it's relatively mild singularity, the one I've shown you. Thank you.